like to uh, invite our first speaker of the morning, Mr. David Chesey, uh, to come up and speak. And uh, those of you who don't know David, he's also the president of OCAL's uh, board of directors. So, David. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, everyone, for coming out today. I know many of you made great efforts to, to be present today, both here at the E-Dome and across the world. This is uh, truly a great event that OCAO is able to showcase itself in a way that uh, is unique because we can reach everybody now uh, on handheld devices, we can reach each other personally, we can reach each other by visitations to our clinics and, and servicing both individuals and groups of individuals. My role as the president and chair of the board of OCAL is to spearhead a group of individuals. We are an 18-member board. Uh, it's made up of many of the people from labor across Ontario. We represent a lot of the different unions. You'll see and you'll hear today, uh, we represent a lot of groups, whether it be unionized. We also have um, the public sector, we have the private sector. We have uh, many people who commit their, their time and their efforts to things like you're going to hear today. When we look at the agenda, uh, it's, it's quite amazing to see the, the talent that we're going to have in the room today. But I think what you're going to appreciate the most is the interactiveness that you're going to be able to have with the, the group, both uh, this morning and this afternoon. And if you're staying this afternoon, for those uh, in the room, the interactiveness of the panelists, you're going to get a lot of information, but you're also gonna have the chance to be able to speak to them and, and ask the questions. Um, there are different, um, there are different things that OCAO does. For many of you who don't know what OCAO does, we are an interdisciplinary team of health professionals that offer services to people in Ontario and, and abroad that have the health professionals like the occupational uh, physicians, we have occupational hygienists, ergonomists, our occupational nurses, and we have a bunch of other people that uh, I think I'd like to thank today as well, both in the room and those that aren't with us. We have a number of staff that are with us today. We have our executive directors, we have our chief operating officer, we have our uh, client service coordinators who make this event possible. So my thanks go out to not only them, but everybody who's had their hand in putting today's event together. We thank the staff right from top to bottom, and we also thank the people you've heard earlier, and Susan was up, she's the vice president of our labor or local advisory committee. This committee is a committee that supports the Sudbury Clinic uh, specifically, but we have seven clinics throughout Ontario, and each of the clinics has its own group of people like yourselves who have the opportunity to join us and assist us in what we do. You help shape and, and guide us in the direction that you want to see OCAO going and what kind of services you need in your community, in your uh, workplace, in your union. We have the ability to come out, reach out, we can do it virtually, we can do it in person, we can do it through literature, we can do it through uh, knowledge transfers, we call them, where you can call in, you can ask questions, and we can provide uh, a wide array of information to you. So when we talk about OCAO, uh, it is the occupational health clinics for Ontario workers. And we also are funded by um, an entity known as the Ministry of Labour through the prevention branch here in Ontario. So I realize that there are people joining us from abroad. So a lot of what you're going to hear today will have an Ontario focus and especially my presentation that I'm going to do this morning, um, it's going to have more of an Ontario legislative base. But know that we have the ability to, to give you information that comes from all around the world. It comes from many studies and many uh, literature, pieces of literature that we can impart to you and give you that knowledge. So I encourage everyone today not only to just sit and listen, but to be actively engaged and to participate and to ask the questions. Uh, for those that uh, have questions that we can't answer, we, we promise to get them to you. Uh, we have Jen at the back who's going to be moderating the discussions online and we'll be getting questions coming in from all over and we'll try to answer those to the best of our ability. 
So ahead of that, uh, again, I, I just want to, to re-emphasize that what we're going to do today does have that Ontario focus at times, but it doesn't mean that it's solely just pertaining to us here in Ontario, but it is actually across Canada and, and worldwide in many instances. This afternoon, you're going to hear a lot of different panelists and a lot of different information. I think you're going to enjoy the program for the day. So those that can stay all day, um, thank you and welcome. So I'm going to start off just with a brief uh, presentation because the theme of uh, the conference today is what is a life worth? So when you think of that, what would you think that question really means? Well, when we look at it from a compensation point of view or a compensable point of view, we look at impairments. We look at the compensation system is designed to allow for benefits for those who suffer workplace accident, injury, or illnesses that result from their work or their workplace. And that comes in many forms. And today you're going to hear different things that uh, deal with the ailments. You'll hear the uh, unfortunate uh, ailments that lead to death. You're going to hear things that relate to the cancers and the, the other kind of um, afflictions that the body will have. We're going to, you have physical, you have the psychological now. And here in Ontario, uh, two years ago, the, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board uh, brought out a new policy called the Chronic Mental Stress Policy, along with what we had, the Traumatic Mental Stress Policy. For years, we were without a policy that dealt with the injuries of the mind. Well, now I'm happy to say that we do have a policy that deals with it. Is it as inclusive and as extensive as we would like? Not quite, but as with everything, uh, we at least have a base to work from. Can it get better? Sure it can. But it only happens when we keep presenting these issues to the compensation boards across the country that they take note and they realize where the deficiencies are, or it could be legislative change. So even you in the audience who are sitting here thinking, oh, this is great, but you know, I'd like a little bit more. Well, it's like anything else. If we don't like something that's in legislation, we have to affect change, and we have to lobby for that change. But we learn from the history of what has happened. We learn from our mistakes, if you will. We learn where things have gone wrong. We learn by challenging those policies that they've made, being the compensation boards or the, or the legislators, then we can, over time, potentially make that different. So part of what I'm going to rely on today is, and I've, I have to also say that, um, again, it is Ontario focused, but it is, it is general enough that you're going to get a feeling for the experience that emanated from Ontario in 1914 has been the model that has been used across Canada to, to guide what all of the compensation boards across Canada have used to try to bring those benefits to the workers in each of the provinces all across our country. So I've worked with the uh, Occupational uh, Disability Response Training Team, the Prevention Link, through the Ontario Federation of Labour. They provide, and they're also funded by and through the Ministry of Labour, they're the group of people that provide the training as it relates to workers' compensation here in Ontario. Many of you in the room, uh, I hope that I won't put many to sleep because there's a lot of practitioners out there, there's a lot of trainers, and there's a lot of um, advocates, and there's a lot of workers and worker advisors and, and people in unions and people outside of unions who help injured workers here in the province who will relate to some of the things that I'm going to, to talk about. What, it, what we're going to deal with, and I may not be able to answer all of your questions, but I want to give you a guide. I want to give you a basis. I want to give you um, a starting point to kind of understand what happens to a person Again, as I mentioned before, from when they, be, they were well, when they were able, when they were fully functional, to something happening at work. And then the next minute, they have a problem. Has anyone here in the room or across the, the globe that's participating, 
you can answer virtually just by putting your hands up. We won't see you quite so vividly, but have you or do you know somebody who suffered a workplace injury? Let's just take a show of hands. Oh my goodness, yes. Not many people didn't put their hands up. Do you know of anybody who has suffered a workplace injury that you may be close to, a relative, a family member? And has that affected your way of being, your life? Yes? Yes. And that's what we have to deal with because what the compensation boards do is provide a monetary compensation, either partially or fully, to try and restore those person's earnings or those person's um, way of life that they were accustomed to before they got injured. Unfortunately, we also have to deal with some of the injuries or illnesses or diseases, more specifically, that people are afflicted with, and that could be the mental illness that we're now more recently trying to deal with in a better fashion, but we're really put by the wayside or forgotten or left out in past because it wasn't so acceptable in society to, to talk about our mental illness, our mental injuries, because it was one of those things that we were embarrassed with or we were not ready to talk about or there weren't all of the, the safety nets put into play to help us deal with those. Sure, we had the ability to deal with the physical injuries. You know, you fall, you break a leg, you break an arm. We all understand that it's going to take a bit of time. We know that it's, you know, six to eight weeks when you're able to be okay today with this right arm, but I've fallen on the ice, maybe in conditions like we're suffering from here in, in Ontario the last couple of days, and we've broken our arm, and we are now in a period of time where we go into a cast, we do different things, and it takes, you know, roughly on average that six to eight period before week period before we get the treatment before the cast comes off if we have surgery then that could delay things and it could complicate things because then we may have lack of function we may not be able to do everything we used to do to the same extent that we did now i'm using a simple example an easy example with with a broken bone or, or a body part but what happens when there's multiple parts of your body that in combination with each other are now not functioning, not functioning as well, totally disabling you. Those ones we see. When I'm, when I'm doing these presentations, I always say that we are people that like to be able to see what's wrong with people before we're able to accept that it's okay that they can't do what they could do before. So we, we we liken it to, if you're in a cast from the tip of your nose to the tip of your toes, then we can say, okay, you have a right not to be able to sit for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. You have the right that you can't walk, or that you need a wheelchair, or that you need some accommodations, or that you need some uh, things done in your workplace to allow you to be a fully functioning participant in that process. But what happens when things are taking on uh, a longer period of time. What happens when you get asthma? What happens when you're diagnosed with asbestosis? And you have these debilitating conditions now that last for days, months, years. And ultimately, we have other things that we don't like to talk about, but you're going to hear about today because we here at Okao deal with these and help you on behalf of your members. Those diseases the cancers, the other things that affect us internally most times that we don't see as well, but they have that, that fatal effect in some cases where death is the end result. That's harder to deal with because, again, those are the unseen, those are the unknowns, those are the, well, I would really like to understand why, but you look fine to me, so why can't you do that? Or I don't understand this, this trajectory you're on uh, of disability, but it's real for the person. And then, as I mentioned, now we're talking about things like the mental disorders, the mental injuries, the mental illnesses. It's only, as I mentioned, about two years that we have been able to start publicly talking about these things. And is it totally accepted today? I would hazard a guess to say not really. We're not quite there yet. 
We're working on it. But if I were to ask you, how many of you know someone, just even one person, who's suffering from a mental illness currently? Lots of hands in the room. Fact is, that's more the norm now. And it could be things that um, a person has contacted through experiences in their work life. Anyone have ever heard of post-traumatic stress disorder? Yes. Well, unfortunately, that is something that's becoming more prevalent in many of our workplaces because of different uh, occurrences that happen to them as a result of their jobs. There's things we can't control. There's things that we can't um, prevent. Okow uses a philosophy of in, uh, prevention through intervention. So how many of you are health and safety activists in the room? Or advocates, lots of you. Well, we all as health and safety activists have a role to play in this process as well. Because part of what we should be doing is looking at the prevention side of things so that we can look to see if there are ways, new ways, different ways, or other ways of dealing with these kind of problems that people suffer through that help people and that restore them to some sort of semblance of normalcy that they used to have. People say that when someone has an injury at work, they just decide that they want to go home, they want to seclude themselves, and they withdraw themselves from society for X number of days, months, or years. Yes, that happens. But there are the other people that suffer workplace accidents, injuries, or illnesses at work where they're able to come back to work. Now, the compensation boards will work very diligently at bringing you back as soon as possible, if not immediately, through the return to work processes. That's one of their paramount goals, is to bring people back to work. And we treat that sometimes as a bad thing. Because we, we've always thought the process, and part of what I will present today, you were awarded with a permanent partial disability pension that was seen in the day as your ticket to ride for the rest of your life. You got compensation for the rest of your life and you didn't ever have to worry. Well, it's not so today. The, the awards and the, the recognition for permanent impairments and what you end up with monetarily is different now. So when we go back to the theme of what's a life worth, that's a, that's a huge, huge statement. So I'm going to give you some of the ways in which the compensation boards look at trying to compensate for people who then suffer these permanent impairments. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have a permanent impairment that you are permanently or totally disabled. But yet, on the far end of the spectrum, it, it could. So let's just look at a few things that workers' compensation, again, is governed by the Workplace Safety Insurance Act here in Ontario and through other le pieces of legislation in other provinces and uh, in other you know, areas in the world. You have these uh, compensation laws that try to help workers who suffer these injuries, accidents, and illnesses in their life. So I mentioned earlier we have the ability to affect change, not necessarily always make the changes because we're not the decision makers. We are the decision influencers. And we can do that through providing solid, rational medical arguments to try to affect change through decisions that flow from the compensation boards and up to the tribunals that have the ultimate say over what is and what isn't proper as far as policy goes. And the tribunals have the, the authority to, in some cases, overturn those, those bad decisions that happen or that we consider not to be appropriate that the WSIBs uh, or the compensation boards across the land have, have made. So we have that power, but do we always exercise that? Not always. So do I encourage everybody to, to fight the fight? Yes, I do. Do I encourage you to wage the war? Sometimes we have to. We have made significant changes over the years. 
sometimes the government decides to make different rules that, that aren't always in our favor or it, to our liking. That's okay. They have that ability to do that. They have the legislative authority to make those decisions. So when we talk about the compensation component and when we talk about these permanent impairments or these permanent impairment awards that people have gotten or are going to get or are getting currently, we have to look at the fact that they're, because of legislative changes, they've been defined in three distinct eras of compensation. So they've, they've apportioned off different parts uh, or different years where there are different levels of benefits that were awarded to people um, when they have suffered the permanent impairments. And those are those that happened before 1990, those accidents that have happened between 1990 and 1997, and these are all referring back to the original date of the injury that the person sustained. Now, when I say the date of injury, that's usually okay, and we understand that fairly well when we talk about those physical injuries. But when we're talking about the more complex cases or the disease-oriented type uh, afflictions, those may only happen after a period of time or what we call the period of latency, when you first become aware that whatever you're suffering from was diagnosed but has been linked back to the work relatedness or the workplace and what happened in that work process or what happened to the body as a result of what you did while at work. So we have the stuff that happened before 1990, we have the other accidents and injuries that happened between 1997, and then we have what we deal with today, those that happened after 1998. So you may say, well, why are we going to talk about stuff that happened before 1990? Like, we're all here today, and if we have an accident today, we're only going to be dealing with the post-1998 stuff, right? Well, the fact is, is that we still, unfortunately today, because of the, the plants and the manufacturing plants and the workplaces, that we're not as safe, that we're not as healthy for us to work in from years gone by. We have people who are just realizing today or just a few years ago or five or ten years ago that they have been afflicted with something that was caused by the work. Well, when they become aware of that, we still have the ability to file a claim and we still have an ability then to be able to have that recognized and be compensated for. Now, the one thing that people always say is, well, compensation doesn't always seem fair because it's such a, a huge road to climb and such a battle to, to undertake versus, you know, I have a sick leave plan at work. I have a weekly indemnification uh, package that I could take. Maybe I have um, some short-term disability benefits or I have a long-term disability plan that, you know, it, it, it pays me right off the bat. It pays me immediately. I don't have to go through the process of filing out paperwork and fighting and getting doctor's notes that have to be specific and be very, very um, focused on the work relatedness and I just don't want the hassle. But I challenge everybody to think differently when this happens to yourself or others that you work with. Because those in the room that are otherwise able-bodied or not impaired by work-related injuries, accidents, or illnesses, or you're, you're otherwise considered fine. Well, I, I challenge you that tomorrow could be a different day. Because an accident can be defined as you're okay one minute, but you're not the next. Could be some fortuitous event, it could be some calamity. It could be something as simple as, you know, something falling on you that, you know, came from a shelf that's, 
got this wobbly leg that's holding it up. And these are what we call accidents. We can't avoid everything. We can't fix everything. We can't make everything right so that we're not going to be injured or become ill because of our workplaces. Because there are, th there are things in our work that do involve chemicals that we have to use because it's part of our daily life. You know, people that uh, are in the cleaning industry know that we clean with chemicals. Uh, I mean, if you look at a can of um, air deodorizer, I mean, they didn't stick a bunch of roses in that can and, and it's this natural uh, smelly substance that's coming out. That's a chemical that's going into the air, that's landing on your skin, that's being absorbed by your skin or inhaled. And it's going into your lungs and it's going into your bloodstream. The people this afternoon on the panel are going to tell you a lot more than I know about all of this stuff, but realize that that is where you could be tomorrow. You're only one accident away from being an injured worker yourself. And that's the scariest part, because as much as we can do to try to prevent or avoid, the ultimate reality is we don't always have that, that luxury, that choice. So when we look back at the history in 1915, the, to compensate people when they have to go off work because of a work-related accident or illness, they were paid at 55% of their gross salary, and there was a seven-day waiting period to get that. So you can see how people would say, well, why would I go off and only get 55% of my gross salary? But you know what? It's better than nothing, because some people don't have any protections, like sick leave plans or short or long-term disability plans. Here in Ontario, we have um, many of our, our workers that do have the luxury of being covered with those type of benefits, but we have an emerging uh, and, a, and a growing workforce of part-time workers who don't have benefits at work. So they need that fallback. So when we look at the evolution of time, when we go from 1915, then we went to 1920, where 66% of your gross wages were paid. And in 1950, it went up to 75% of your gross earnings were paid. And in 1985, which isn't too, too long ago, really, you know, in the, in the span of, of one's lifetime, we went to a point where we got 90% of our net average earnings, and the waiting period was then absolved. So we now get that 90% of our net average earnings from the day, well, day following the accident, because the employer pays for the first day of your accident, right? And you're expected to be at work the next day, unless you can't, for some or whatever reasons. And then into 1998, it changed, and now it, and these are all legislative changes, we go to a, a model where you're paid 85% of your net average earnings. Now, what might be uh, important to note here is that when you're looking at this, you may say 85%, but I can go off on 100% or whatever if I go on my short or long-term disability plans. But normally those plans pay something like 66 and two-thirds of your salary. But compensation is um, where, where you will report those earnings, but they're completely deductible. So it's as though it's tax-free in, in a sense, right? So there are benefits. Now, the workers' compensation system is, in fact, designed to protect workers from the financial hardships. Because nobody, if I were to ask in the room and across the globe, how many people live paycheck to paycheck? Please don't tell me. But <laughs> many people say to me that, you know, if I can't make that wage on my paycheck next week, then I have to put into a hat. Does the mortgage get paid? Do I get groceries for the kids? Or what, what goes? What has to not be paid? Now, I don't think anybody that's here and listening across the globe would say that that's a comfortable feeling. So we have to kind of admire the fact that we have a system that does compensate for those losses, those financial hardships that are associated with the work-related injuries and those occupational diseases that we're going to talk about today. So it doesn't just pay for the compensation for your earnings. We also look at the health care that you might need because of the recuperation or recovery time that it's going to take 
And let's take that right arm that I, that I was talking about that got broken uh, a few minutes ago, right? So you've broken your arm. Well, we all know that nine out of 10 times you end up in a cast for you know, four to six to eight weeks, what have you. It all depends. It's all up to the, the medical professionals to, to do the assessments and determine that. But at the end of the day, when you've been immobile, for a period of six to eight weeks, and you haven't moved that part of your body, you know, your muscles, your tendons, all start to say, hey, I got a problem here. I haven't been working for a while. It's gonna take me a while to get back on to my ability to function. So we have to do therapy. So you might have to do some physiotherapy, or maybe it's massage therapy, maybe it's chiro, whatever the case may be. You're going to have these healthcare benefits that the, the compensation boards are there to provide so that you don't have to, if you have, those health benefits from your workplace. Why would you want to use those benefits that you're not sick? Those are for maintenance, to make you feel good. Like, you know, when you're not feeling great, you go for a massage and, oh, I feel great after that, right? Well, that's what that money, that's what those benefits should be paying for. But when you have a work-related injury, it's really the responsibility of the WSIB or the compensation board to pay for that therapy, to pay for the medicine, to pay for the treatment plan that will get you well and will bring you back to hopefully that state where you can function somewhat, moderately, or totally again. Because let's face it, if you have a broken arm or a broken leg, once the healing process is complete, usually that means you're back to what is considered full function. So what we focus on in the payments is paying for those impairments where you have that loss of function, either temporarily, but more importantly here, permanently. That it's never, you're never going to be back to your 100%. So I mentioned those eras. So once a worker is healed as good as expected or as, as well as they can be, or they've reached that plateau, or they've reached the state where they're as good as they're ever going to be, notwithstanding that injury that they've sustained to that part of the body, that's what we call maximum medical recovery. The doctors, the healthcare practitioners, submit to the WSIBs to say, all right, this worker now is at the level that they are the best that we can see that they're ever going to be in their ability to function, notwithstanding the problem they have with that right arm or that leg or whatever the case may be. It's a little harder though, and I think you'll appreciate that it's not always as easy to assess and to understand when it comes to those unknown, unseen illnesses. Again, if you're not in the cast from the tip of your nose to the tip of your toes, people think, eh, you're fine. Mental illness, they say the same. Well, you look fine to me. Why can't you do this? Why can't you function? Well, it's a harder, it's a harder answer to, to provide. So when we look at the eras of benefits again, you have the pre-1990 where you get the permanent partial disability awards. And I'm gonna bring you through these to give you a slight example of a monetary calculation as to what a person's worth, <laughs> how much they get monetarily, you know that big, check that they get to stick in their pocket because of that impairment that they've now suffered. Well, those are, and were only awarded until 1990. Then it changed in 1990 and all the way through to 1997 where it was now called a non-economic loss award. And when you look at that, you have to say, well, what does that really mean? Well, non-economic means everything other than the money you should get because of your salary. That's the easiest way I can explain it. It's to recognize that because of that accident or ill injury that you've suffered, you now have a permanent impairment. You're not able to move your whatever, that part of your body, 100% anymore. So they're going to measure and they're going to figure out to what degree are you permanently impaired, convert that into a percentage of your whole body, because they're going to look at your whole body and say, well, that right arm, you still have the rest of your body that's still got some abilities. So in 1998, it, it stayed the same, 
and it's the non-economic loss awards again. So it's dictated by the era and the date of accident. So I talked about this, this wild and wonderful thing called maximum medical recovery. Well, that's where they will look at the recent clinical evidence that's provided by your healthcare practitioner that indicates the change in the work-related injury or disease. It'll look at the worker and look to see if they're receiving or if they're going to receive treatment that's likely going to improve their work-related injury or illness. So what you can do by way of therapy or healthcare measures, are you going to get better? What's the likelihood? And the worker's then receiving treatment or using the medication to maintain that current level of ability. And if required, they will then get a clinical opinion from their own doctors at WSIB to conduct that assessment or to at least provide the medical background if it's not in your own medical file. Now, we used to have what was called a roster of non-economic loss doctors that were trained to do these evaluations and these calculations. But the board has since gotten away from those because Physicians don't have the time, they don't have the abilities to see all their patients and then see someone for compensation to do these, these tests. So they've gotten away from that saying, you know, it's not worth our time. So the WSIB has assigned those to their own health practitioners, sometimes at, you know, regional evaluation centers like uh, local hospitals or physiotherapy clinics that will do these things. Now, you have to look then at what is going to happen on an ongoing basis? What is that physical abnormality? What is that physical loss? What is that functional abnormality? What is the, the functional loss that people will see? Like there's some part of, or all the part of the functioning of that body part or organ or system that is not working. Disfigurement. Well, that's an altered or abnormal appearance such as the alteration of color, shape, structure, or combination of all of these and the psychological damage, the loss of abnorm or abnormal psychological functioning. So we did have that cognitive, that psychological ability to function, now we don't. So you ask, okay, so how is this done? We have to determine that it's as a result of the work, because remember, anything that happens because of your home life, like if you fall and break your leg at home, you're not going to be compensated by WSIB because that's not considered a work-related accident. But are you going to suffer the ill effects of that at work? Yes, you're going to need to be accommodated. You're going to need all of that kind of stuff, but you're not going to necessarily get the, the benefits of the compensation system in all cases. So you have to look at uh, the work-relatedness and whether the current diagnosis is the same or is compatible with the initial work-related injury or disease diagnosis. They're going to look at things like whether the clinical evidence of the impairment is related to that current diagnosis. So it's very important that we always get clear, clear, clear medical. And whether that or if a pre-existing condition or other non-work related factor is causing, it is the cause, or it's contributing to that impairment. So then they look at the degree, and you see the little house next to it. It's going to be reflected in a percentage format. So there's a prescribed rating schedule, and there's an impairment that's listed, meaning I can't move my arm. It's functionally not working properly. The impairment uh, it may not be listed by the decision maker, but they have to look at the body parts or the systems or the functions that are most similar. Like if it's not precise, they have to look and try to figure out whether it's, it's close to or, you know, as relatively close to as possible. And then the degree of impairment is then expressed, as I said, in that, that percentage. And the NEL is rated by what we call a NEL clinical specialist. They are a special department at the compensation board where all they do is calculate these awards. They read the medical. They look at the values in the American Medical Association guidelines of permanent disability. Uh, third edition, and they do all these wonderful calculations. They throw them into this big magic computer. Uh, it gets all jumbled up, and out pops this wonderful percentage and a check that goes along with it. Now, this degree of PI is expressed as the whole person, because remember, we're not looking at the whole body, but we have to take the whole body into consideration because we have to look at what is the percentage 
of my whole body that's impaired by this one injury. So that percentage of the impairment, you have to look at the age at the time of the impairment of the worker. And you have to look at things like base rates. They look at, for example, $45,000 the base rate for a worker at age 45. So now we're going to get into some calculations to give you a flavor for how wonderful and how much money you're going to get for all of these things that happen to you as a result of work. But then they have to take off or add to $1,000 for every year that you're younger or older than 45. Eh, so that's an arbitrary number, but they had to pick a number. So those of you who are 45 or more in the room, mm, bad news, you're going to get things taken away. Those of you who are younger than 45 in the room, start smiling because they're going to add to your, your money. But don't get all excited because it's not going to be a lot of money. Whereas in the past, prior to 1990, the same worker, age 45, had a 10% permanent impairment award. Uh, $45,000 was the base rate, and you multiply that by 10%. Very simple and sincere. $4,500 is your NEL award. But if you're 35, remember, we have to increase that by $1,000 for every year you're under 45, so you're going to get $5,500, so a whopping $1,000 difference. Woohoo! Everybody excited now? Is everybody excited now? I don't hear you. Give me a woohoo! Oh my goodness, it's still early. All right. Well, now, you saw that whopping amount, didn't you? Let's look a week earlier. If you got injured just one week earlier, we have to use a meat chart. Oh dear, how did that get in there? That's the wrong meat chart. Well, you know, for those meat eaters in the room, you know that you have to have some sort of a meat chart to tell you which part of the beef that you like to eat the most, that's the most tastiest, that's the most valuable, and by the way, that's the most expensive, right? Well, unfortunately, they don't use that meat chart. They use this meat chart, because that's a real body. So in the old system, in the PPD system, it was very simple. They would do a process, they'd bring you in, the doctor would look at you and estimate by using this chart. Sometimes a little clear if it's amputations and things of that nature, but when it comes to mobility and things of that nature, it was very arbitrary. And they would assign a value similar to this, whatever part of the body. Like look at the one of the hand, for, for instance. You know, each, each part of your finger 1 point, or 1 1.2 plus 1.2 plus 0.6 equals, if you've lost your ring finger, you know? It's, it doesn't seem right. So let's look at another, this is a more updated type of a meat chart that they, they use. It's, it still says the same thing, but it gives you a little bit of a better understanding of what percentage would be attributed to your permanent impairment for these types of body parts. So let's look at that person. So this is an injury that happened before 1990. That person is still that same 45-year-old person, and it's still that 10% permanent impairment award. Monthly compensation rate was $2,000. So you multiply that $2,000 by the 10% permanent impairment award, that person would receive $200 a month. Now you say, mm, well, I like that $3,500 or that $4,500 amount. Problem is, the NEL, the Non-Economic Loss Award, is designed that that's a one-time lump sum. Your only payment that you get for that permanent impairment. But you look at the permanent partial disability pensions, you get $200 a month for life. So how does that calculate or compare? Well, 2018, you have that 45-year-old person, 10% permanent impairment, the base rate, 59981 times 10%, that person would get $5,998.17. That's it, only, once, lump sum. And then you compare that to that 45-year-old with the 10% PPD award, $2,000 times 10, they get that $200 for life, right? You, you're with me? Well, that would translate to 
a whole lot more money. That 30 year, like over 30 years, I'll go back one, sorry. Over 30 years, because remember, that person was 45 when they got injured, but they lived to be 75. Do you know how much that person would make in that personal, pers uh, permanent partial disability pension? $72,000 versus $5,998.17. So my question to you is, which would you prefer? You'd like that $72,000 one. Sorry to say. But most people in the room today won't get that because you don't have the injury before 1990. But some of our parents, our grandparents, maybe even a little further extended than that for the younger people in the room, these people still have a shot at that permanent partial disability award because they were injured before 1990. So what is a life worth? Why do you think that changed? I started off by telling you that it was legislative change. Legislative change means policy change at the WSIBs across the country. What it means is, now I know this is going to sound biased, but what I hear most often is people say to me, well, the government realized that it was way too expensive to pay people so much for the rest of their life because they were injured, got ill, or died on the job. We would rather pay them a one-time lump sum award of this pittance versus what could be perceived as something more sustainable. Now, is it going to pay for everything to live your life? No, it certainly won't. But the moral of the story, I think you can see, is that it certainly provides for a little more than what you get now. But let's not balk at it. At least there's still something that recognizes the permanent Sorry, I don't mean to into the microphone. But when you're talking PPP, it's hard to not do that. So that injured worker, 10% of the impairment at age 35, you see that in 1989, they would get $200 a month for life, age 55. Then in 1990, they'd get that lump sum of about $5,500. And even to today, they would because that's post-90, then you would still get... Almost the same with a little bit of inflation for the lump sum in 2019. It'll be about $7,500. Because every year, the, the inflationary rates kick in, and it's a little bit higher, and the maximums go up, and the ceilings go up. But that's a lot of technical jargon that you can do when you take you know, some specified courses and, and learn more about this. But as far as that goes for now, that's just me giving you a little bit of a dive into the world of permanent impairment. So I hope that it was valuable. You can see what really a life is now worth and how it's rated and how the board assigns those values to people when they become permanently or partially disabled on the job. Thank you very much.